morning, everyone. For this week, we're actually doing what is uh, in some ways a follow-up to a presentation we heard in February when retired Justice Virginia Long introduced many of us to the topic of forensic evidence. And she presented a very uh, uh, enlightening history of forensics. And I looked up the word forensics to make sure I was uh, correct in what I was interpreting. Uh, and it's described as the use of scientific tests in connection with the detection of crime. And our speaker this week will now give us uh, information on the use of that information in, sol in detection and solving of crimes. The speaker is Dr. Stephen Marcus. Stephen uh, received his undergraduate degree at Brooklyn College and medical degree at the Medical College of Virginia. He did postdoctoral training in both New York City and Boston. He's certified in pediatrics and medical toxicology. He had hospital appointments, including Newark Beth Israel Hospital and UMDNJ, which is now part of Rutgers. Uh, he specialized in pediatrics and poison control. And his work with toxicology ranged from heavy metals, that is the uh, uh, chemical, uh, the, the chemical, not the music, and to uh, prescription medications and street drugs. From 1983 to 2016, he was the executive and medical director of the New Jersey Poison Information and Educational System, of which he's also the founder. Uh, he is the, has been served as the chair of the New Jersey Physicians uh, Lead Poisoning Prevention Committee, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Emerging Medicine, Pediatrics, Preventive and Community Medicine at Rutgers, and he's received Certificate of Lifetime Achievement from the American Association of Poison Control Centers, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Department of Health and Senior Services from the City of East Orange. Stephen has consulted on numerous occasions through uh, contributions to books and written uh, media, as well as serving as a consultant to documentaries on TVs and movies, depicting cases in which he was involved. One of the most notable of these is the one he'll be sharing with us this morning. And with that, I introduce to you Dr. Stephen Marcus. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to, to join you all. Uh, hopefully this is working properly. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning everybody and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it was interesting this morning, my, uh, I was walking my granddaughter to uh, a school bus and she turned to me and said, Pop Pop, how did you get interested in toxicology? Uh, I'm not going to bore you with that in the beginning. If there's enough time and people are interested, I can explain uh, uh, some of that to you. But let's, uh, without further ado. <clears throat> okay, this, uh, this talk is called Murder in the ICU, and you'll understand why in a minute. Well, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, I was the medical director of the New Jersey Poison Information Education System, which we called NJ Pies, which most people think of as the Poison Control Center. And we took calls. We still they, they, people still take calls from around the state, from uh, professionals as well as the public. Over eighty-five percent of the calls come from the public, and about ten percent come from the hospitals. And the calls from the public are rather simple to answer. The calls from the hospitals can get rather harrowing. And one fine day, a call came to the Poison Center about a woman at a hospital in, in New Jersey. Uh, and there's no kidding around. That's the hospital right there, that's Somerset Medical Center. This was a 40-year-old woman that had had history of cancer in the past. And one of the chemotherapeutic agents that she received uh, damaged her heart. 
And because of that, she was on a medication called digoxin. Digoxin is, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about it to you in the future, but it, it's a medication to try to control the, both the rate and the force of contraction on her heart. On the second day in the hospital, her heart slowed down to dangerously low rate and cardiology saw her and said, we're going to stop the digoxin. Well, they stopped the digoxin and her heart rate uh, recovered and she did quite well. However, three days later, she developed a, again an irregular heartbeat and uh, they drew a digoxin level and it was 9.94. Now, I, I can be very glib and say to you, well, what do you think the normal digoxin level is? Well, obviously the normal level is zero, uh, but a therapeutic level when you use the drug is in about the one nanogram per milliliter range. And hers was nine, which was an extraordinarily high level, uh, so high that it would be considered toxic. The following day, and she, she survived that, uh, the following day her level dropped to four and the next day to two. Uh, and they looked back at, at the uh, at blood that was drawn on the day of admission and found her dig level was in, in the normal range or in, in the therapeutic range. So the hospital called the, the, a nurse at the hospital called the poison center to say, you know, what, what went on? How can you explain uh, this elevation in, in her digital level? <clears throat> well, this, uh, this happened and I just pay attention to the date is June 25th, 2003. After the discussion, and the person that you, you speak to on the phone is not necessarily me. It's uh, one of the, what we call poison information specialists. And the first call to this uh, poison information specialist named Shirley. Uh, Shirley was a, a physician that was trained out of the country that for reasons uh, of the, the way things work in the States, uh, could not be, was not allowed to practice medicine in the, in, the, in the US, but worked at the poison center as a poison information specialist. And she had spoken to the nurse and the nurse discussed this with her and Shirley discussed with me what to do. Uh, and one of the stories was that, in fact, the, uh, this person was uh, diagnosed as, as having a, uh, uh, what's called sick sinus. The sinus is the, the part of the heart that sends out the impulses to tell the heart to beat. And uh, she had had these abnormalities uh, and uh, was seen by cardiology for it. Uh, on the, the 13th, that was you know, roughly a week and a half prior to uh, the time the, the call to the poison center and the, uh, the letter from it, uh, from them. Well, we had uh, discussed with the nurse the fact that one of the things that was going on is that this woman of Korean uh, ancestry liked to drink a particular kind of tea. And the question that uh, came up was, could the tea have anything to do with the, uh, the elevation in the digoxin level. Uh, and she had stopped taking the tea and the digoxin level came down. So the question was, could it be related to the tea? Well, my comment was, uh, I've never heard of uh, any of these sort of um, mushroom or mixtures having dig in it, but send us a sample and let us get it tested and we'll see whether that's an, an explanation. Well, this is uh, the plant that the, the medication DIG actually comes from. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, this particular variation is Digitalis purpura. And it, uh, it's a biennial, which uh, interestingly enough, I, I kind of fell in love with when I was in high school. Uh, I was a Brooklyn kid and we used to go to the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. And I don't know how many of you know what a biennial is, but the first year, all you get is leaves. The second year, you get this spike of, of flowers that grow up in this kind of trumpet shape, uh, beautiful color. Uh, and I was intrigued by it. And actually I did a rotation at the uh, uh, nuclear energy, uh, the, the nuclear research facility out on Long Island, and we irradiated seeds to see what we could do with them and what have you. And so I, I, I kept my interest in, 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 in DIG. Um, these are some other plants that also contain uh, DIG-like substance. 
uh, Oleander, and there was a movie, The White Oleander. Oleander, unfortunately, is one of the one of the plants that that people notab uh, notably use uh, to commit suicide, actually. And and there's a website, uh, the 50 best ways to commit suicide, and they they tell people how to mix up a a, a brew of oleander tea. Uh, it really is not totally natural, but if you go to the Morris County uh, Arboretum, there's a beautiful display of, of oleander and they're actually come in different colors and they're absolutely gorgeous. Lily of the Valley is, is ubiquitous and you probably uh, think of it almost as a weed in your backyard. We had it in our backyard when I lived in Essex County. Uh, and it, it's kind of neat with the, the, the neat little flowers, but again, uh, eating it can get you in, in, into trouble. Well, uh, Dr. Withering in, uh, uh, in the late 1700s or early 1800s uh, discovered that the, the abs uh, extract from the foxglove uh, uh, plant it can be given to people with dropsy, with heart failure, and it, it cured it. But he also noticed that if you give too much of it, you'll drop the heart rate down significantly and you can actually produce uh, unconsciousness and, and even death. So here we have uh, a, a very observant uh, physician that not only picked up the positive attributes of, of a drug and the negative attributes, and we call that the therapeutic window. There's a certain concentration within which the, a, a medication uh, or a, a, you know, a botanical can actually help. Whereas if you go beyond that, it, it, you can actually make things worse. And that's, that's something that we think about every single time we write a prescription or we should, every physician should always think about uh, the risk benefit. In other words, what good are we gonna get from using a medication versus what are the downsides of using a medication? And that's really the whole science of toxicology is not just to look at the bad side, but to look at what a, what a medication or a substance can do that can help a person and what it can do if, if you get into trouble. Well, <clears throat> so what are cardiac glycosides? DIG, DIG is one of the cardiac glycosides. When I was in medical school, we actually used uh, the dried leaf of that plant, and it was called digitalis leaf. And there were three other versions of, of, of digitalis glycosides that were used. Today, virtually the only one used at all is digoxin. Uh, it was virtually the only drug used for uh, congestive heart failure for many years. Uh, but the narrow range of uh, the therapeutic window, the range between effective use in heart failure and toxicity was so narrow that it became one of the most dangerous drugs uh, on, on the uh, uh, pharmacopoeia. So it really doesn't get used very much anymore, but it does increase the force of contraction of the heart and it does slow the heart rate down. Now, if you look down in my little cartoon there, what it does is there's a very delicate balance between the concentration of sodium and potassium across the cell membrane. Uh, and there's a pump called the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which literally pumps sodium outside of the cell, which you can see over here. And at the same time pumps potassium inside the cell. It doesn't do it in equal proportions. There's a, there's a certain amount of excess sodium outside to potassium inside. And the, if you think about the, that sodium and potassium are being electric, uh, uh, potential, it leaves an actual potential difference across the cell membrane. And so when a nerve and the uh, nerve fires, it interrupts that, uh, that it changes that, that potential across the cell membrane. And there's a rapid flow of sodium into the cell, a rapid flow of potassium outside of the cell. And that's what causes the uh, actual heart to, to beat. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated, but let's leave it at that because it's important to know the concept of the fact that potassium rapidly flows out of the cell um, when, the, uh, when that impulse hits it. What, the, uh, what DIG does is interrupts that sodium potassium ATPase pumps and has more potassium leaking outside and, and sodium going inside. 
and that makes the, the, the heart muscle actually contract uh, more strongly and, and more slowly. Well, this, I don't know how many of you recognize this uh, picture. When I was a uh, sophomore and second year in medical school taking pharmacology, which uh, was obviously my favorite course in medical school, uh, we learned about the term uh, scintillating scotomata. And I, I, to, to this day, I, I love that term. And what it means is that you have visual abnormalities uh, when, you, when you're on ditch, you can have visual abnormalities. And the starry night, the, those, those yellow halos around the stars are in fact visual scotomata. So we, we, we believe that uh, Van Gogh uh, knew about the use of, of ditch and knew of the side effect, and that's the visual scotomata, and how much Ditch actually played in the role of the Impressionists, we're not 100% sure. However, this is uh, Van Gogh's physician, Dr. G Gachet, and this is a famous painting that uh, Van Gogh did of, of, of his doctor, and if it was in a pub in what, I don't remember the name of the town, but if you look, at the sprig of flower that Dr. Gachet is holding, there is our foxglove. Uh, now, foxglove was used uh, for mental disorders. Uh, we don't know whether it was also used to get high during his time, but it's certainly very possible that the Impressionists that used to uh, group around Van Gogh in that pub might all have been tripping out on, on Ditch. To, to get those funny uh, impressions. Anyhow, let's get back to the case. Uh, two weeks after that call, uh, I was walking by uh, Bruce Ruck, who was the managing director of the Poison Center. Bruce is a doctoral degree uh, person in, in pharmacy. And he was on the phone uh, because a pharmacy from that same hospital called the Poison Center uh, asking to discuss a problem with, with a, a patient with digoxin. And I overheard Bruce talking uh, about it. And, you, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been listening, but, you, you know, just walking by his, his desk and hearing him, I said, you know, who are you talking to? And he said, Somerset Hospital. I said, I already spoke to them about that, you know, a, a week and a half ago. And so I heard him say, uh, did you already speak to my director? And the uh, response was no, uh, that, was, uh, that was not me and that was not the same patient. This is another patient that was started on, on digoxin on the sixth day of the hospitalization. And on the 13th day, the levels were fine in their therapeutic range. But on day 15, this second patient developed an auricular heartbeat with no more ditch uh, given and a level rose to, to you know, 9.61. Uh, and they thought that the uh, irregular heartbeat was related to uh, the toxicity from ditch. And she actually received, uh, uh, I think it was a she, uh, received a, an antidote for ditch poisoning called ditch uh, that's a That's a brand name. I probably shouldn't have used it, but uh, I apologize for that. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's an antibody that's produced in sheep that actually uh, you, you inject intravenously and captures the, the circulating ditch and, and makes it no longer effective. <clears throat> so now I'm standing there saying, there's, there's something strange. Why would there be two patients with, with unsuspecting, you, you know, with, with no reason to have ditch toxicity? So I, uh, Bruce was still on the phone and I said to him, ask the pharmacist if anything else has happened recently strange in, in the hospital, any other unexplained uh, overdoses. Well, the pharmacist then said that there were two patients in the same ICU uh, as her patient and as the patient that I had spoken to uh, the, two weeks ago that developed severe hypoglycemia, that's low blood sugar. Uh, and uh, was in the same hospital, and they, you know, were, were scratching their heads on why that would happen. 
and they actually drew insulin levels and found that both of these patients had high insulin levels. Um, and we know when the body produces insulin, you, you can't have a tumor of your pancreas. And when the body produces that insulin, you also produce another substance called C-peptide. And it's not that they're an equal quantity, but you should always see some elevation in C-peptide if you have naturally produced insulin. And interestingly enough, they actually called a, an endocrinologist on these patients that had hypoglycemia, and they found a high level of insulin, but no level of C-peptide. And they looked for what are called uh, uh, oral hypoglycemic agents in the urine, uh, and those work by having the uh, body produce increased uh, amounts of insulin. Uh, and they found none of that in the urine. So we now had two patients that had unexplained ditch poisoning, two patients that had unexplained uh, insulin. So uh, would anybody listening have, have thought anything uh, strange was going on? Well, I think common sense is somewhat of an oxymoron. Uh, and actually uh, somebody, I don't remember which of my kids bought me a t-shirt uh, that said uh, that uh, common sense is so uncommon that it should be called a superpower. Uh, and my, one of my other granddaughters this morning said, well, then she's, she's got superpower. So what went through my mind? Well, these were the three things that, that went through my mind. And one was, was a massive medication error in the hospital. Uh, the Institute for, um, of Medicine, I can't remember what they now call themselves, years ago printed a report uh, on uh, med errors and they said medical errors um, uh, medication errors are responsible for 50 to 100 million u.s deaths a year in, in hospitals uh, i don't know whether that's quite true but there are there are certainly med errors that, that are made uh unfortunately uh, all too commonly and you know it's Often it's two medications that, that have similar names, similar spellings, and somebody, pharmacist or a nurse or somebody, mixes it up and gives the wrong medication. So, you know, could this have been a, a, a huge uh, medication error uh, with both DIG and insulin in the same ICU? Possible. Uh, that would have to be looked into. Could it have been multiple laboratory errors? Well, you know, these the, the chemical laboratories in hospitals do these things. Most of them are uh, things like the DIG levels are done by kits. Kids, kids can be contaminated, and, and we know of any number of times where there have been recalls of it. So, yeah, I guess it would be possible, and that went through my mind. Could this be multiple lab errors? But what stuck in my gut was that over the years, there have been, unfortunately, a significant number of reports of nefarious administration, uh, purposeful giving of medications. Um, and sometimes it's, it's done in an effort to make yourself into being a hero. You give a, you give a medication that you know is reversible, and then you run in when the patient gets sick, sick and give an antidote or save a patient's life and you become a hero or are the cases where people literally are giving it to, to, to kill people, uh, patients. So those are the, the three things that, that went through my mind. The other, the other thing that went through my mind is, what the heck do I do with, with this knowledge that I have in a hospital with four unexplained overdoses? So my first was, is this a reportable occurrence? And if it is, who do I report it to? Uh, and what should I tell them? If I just pick up the phone and tell them, I think there's somebody killing, trying to kill people in a hospital, are they gonna take me seriously or are they just gonna say that this is some kook? And what my legal responsibility to either report it or to not report it? Uh, and these were kind of ethical dilemmas that I had to go through. And lastly, what is the possible fallout from reporting it versus non-reporting? The funding for the Poison Center uh, is through uh, mandatory contributions from hospitals. Uh, if uh, I report this hospital, uh, 
they're obviously not going to be happy with me and not going to want to support us financially. And it gets, if it gets out to the other hospitals in the state, then I'm squealing on a hospital. Uh, could I be jeopardizing the, the future existence of the poison center? So uh, these are all the, the things that kind of worried me. So what did I do? Well, I called the hospital and said, I want to have a conference call with the chief medical officer and the risk manager. We need to discuss these four cases. Uh, I said, well, I probably going to have to report this at least to the state health department because there is some mandatory reporting of nosocomial outbreaks and down below uh, any nosocomial is defined as a, uh, an outbreak of illness uh, in a hospital, either acquired in the hospital or spread within the hospital. Uh, and, and that is a, a mandatory uh, r reporting incident. Well, I also was doubting myself, so I scheduled myself to present the case to a regional uh, monthly meeting that we have among the toxicologists we meet every month in New York City, and we present interesting cases. And, and I wanted to be sure that I wasn't missing something uh, that somebody else might that occur. I always doubt everything that I, that I think about. Okay, so what happened? Well... Uh, this is a picture on, on over here of Dr. Kors. He's the chief, he was the chief medical officer at, at the hospital. And he refused to admit that there was a problem. He said there was an obviously logical explanation for the, uh, the, the occurrences. And he refused to, to listen to me. And uh, I, I do have to admit that there were some times during the discussions where uh, I refused to let him push me around and so I may have raised my voice a, a, a few times. Uh, so he said he was not going to report it. They didn't even care what pressure I put on him. And actually, when I said, well, I have to report it. And he said, if you want to report it, go ahead. Well, again, in high school, uh, in my, I guess, my junior year, I took a, my, my English course was on uh, theater. And one of the things we read was the play, An Enemy of the People by Henri Ibsen. And I don't know how many of you may have read the play or seen the play, but it was situated in a Norwegian, small Norwegian hamlet uh, where the local physician noted an excessive number of people getting sick. And the only thing that they had in common was visiting the local spa and the local hot springs. And he uh, uh, hypothesized that something about those hot springs were making people sick. His brother, however, was the mayor of town and his brother refused to do anything about it because the community uh, made their money uh, because of the spa. Now, move forward a, a, a hundred some odd years and the first movie Jaws came out. And if you remember Jaws, it was the same sort of a situation. Somebody thought that there were uh, killer sharks uh, attacking people and killing people. But the mayor of the town says, oh, no, no, we can't make a big deal out of it because the waterfront is too important for our living. Uh, this in the in the, the enemy, the people, uh, this was the comment from the mayor to his brother. Uh, and, and, and what the mayor said is, you you can't just think of the people getting sick. You got to think of the wider implications. And that's actually what Dr. Porus said. He said he was not going to report it because he didn't want to risk people distrusting the hospital and all of the people that might get sick because they distrusted going to the hospital. Forget about the fact that if there was somebody trying to kill people in that hospital, then people going into the hospital were at risk for being killed uh, because he was worried about the wider implications. So again, uh, having uh, the hospital refusing uh, to cooperate, what, what did I do? Well, I called uh, emergency medical services for the state of New Jersey. Um, they were our granting organizations. They're the ones that control our funding. And as I said, I was worried that the hospitals would would, would renege and we'd be in trouble. And it also turned out that the assistant commissioner of health who was in charge of EMS was the state epidemiologist. So I called and uh, tried to get through to him. I had a little trouble at first 
you, you know, how do you leave a message? I think somebody's killing people at, at some hospital. What, what do we do now? Uh, but when I finally spoke to him, he said, Marcus, you read too many detective novels. Uh, you know, just this is this is this is nothing. Uh, well, uh, and he told me it was not a nosocomial outbreak, despite my showing you the definition. And so he refused to do an epidemiological study of the outbreak, but said he would he that I should contact the licensing side of the department and have them do a licensing uh, evaluation. So that's what I did. Uh, again, this is the definition of nosocomial, and you can either agree or disagree with him or I. Uh, I still insist that that was a nosocomial outbreak. It was an infection, there's no question. And if you look at most reporting requirements in, in any state, not just New Jersey, they always deal with infectious diseases. They rarely deal with chemical problems or, or uh, poisonings such, such as this. In some states, calls to the poison center are reportable. We did not go that way because we knew that, that there was no way that we were gonna be able to enforce it. But I, I thought pretty strongly that, that this is something that needed to be reported. So this is the, the email that I sent to uh, the woman in charge of the licensing portion of the state health department. Uh, also note the date, uh, July 10th. And I couched it as best I could uh, that I you know, felt that somebody needed to, to go in and see what was going on. Uh, and again, that was on, on July 10th. Uh, I also made sure that I requested uh, both in, in writing and verbally that if they could not come up with an obvious explanation, either the massive medication error or lab error, then uh, I felt the Department of Health had to reach out to the Attorney General's office because it seemed to me that something was going on that, uh, that was of a, of a criminal nature. Now you say, okay, Marcus, why didn't you go right to the attorney general's office? My answer is because I had no idea who to, to report to. Uh, I don't know how many of you have much experience with the, with the law enforcement, but we have a gamut of, of uh, police departments. We have the local police that take care of local codes and speeding in towns and what have you. We have county. Uh, we also have county police, we have a county sheriff, uh, we have the state police, uh, and it's, it's kind of a loose association. And to be honest, nobody ever taught me in medical school or residency who to report what to. Uh, in child abuse, we report to the Division of Youth and Family Services, which has now changed its name. I think it's now, I, I can't remember what it's called anymore. But anyhow, so that is, is easy. We, we know who to report that to. But I've subsequently learned that if, if it's a capital uh, case, in other words, if there actually is a death, then that gets reported to the county medical examiner, not even the county prosecutor. But that if a death occurs, that has to be reported to the medical examiner. If there's an attempted murder, you might be able to get away with reporting that to the county prosecutor's office. And they have their own detectives or police force that can, if they choose, investigate that. But otherwise, if there's no death, then you report it to the local uh, uh, police department, which generally speaking are not well equipped to, to handle those kinds of situations. So to be quite honest at the time, I had no idea who to report it to. And that's why I turned to the Department of Health for their advice. And uh, obviously that was not, whoops, of not of much help. What the heck? Oh, sorry about that. It worked out backwards. Well, after the discussion that I had with, uh, with Dr. Coors and the, uh, the risk manager, they wrote off this letter uh, to the Department of Health, to the state epidemiologist, the person that told me I read too many medical detective stories, uh, complaining about my behavior, uh, that I was jumping to conclusions and I was taking an adversarial uh, position and I was uh, uh, 
confrontational. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess I probably was. Uh, they were not listening. They were refusing to investigate. And I didn't know how else uh, uh, to react. They actually sent a similar letter to the State Board of Medical Examiners, which uh, sort of threatened my, my medical license. Uh, you know, I, 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 my position was take, uh, take the offensive, and I wrote to the state uh, medical examiner. Interestingly enough, they never responded to me, and I explained the situation, and uh, obviously nothing came of that. <clears throat> it's interesting that later after the story broke, uh, in, a, in an article in the New York Times, Dr. Kors, who was a, the director, who was a chief medical uh, officer, uh, was quoted as saying abnormal digitalectals, uh, they, they occur all the time. And it didn't stick out like a sore thumb. And, you know, uh, thank God that is not the case. Uh, you know, Abnormal dig levels and indication that nurses take the and, and give the incorrect medications are not everyday occurrences. They shouldn't be everyday occurrences, and, and this is just total nonsense. Uh, Dr. Bresnes, the state epidemiologist, did respond to Dr. Kors. Again, look at the timing. He calls the, the mid to end, to end of June when we first got the calls into July. Now we're into August. Still nothing really substantive happening except letters going back and forth and me calling the health department saying, where are we going? What are we doing? <clears throat> it was interesting, though, that he did say that it was appropriate uh, that they should report as a possible incident under the, uh, the state regulations. Uh, but all of those state regulations, again, uh, relate to not to somebody potentially hurting somebody, but to, you know, because of possible uh, lab errors or, or medication errors. So what happened? Well, uh, they, uh, the health department informed me over and over again that if they find no logical explanation, they would call the attorney general's department uh, office. On October 3rd, we got a very strange telephone call uh, to the Poison Center requesting uh, that we send them an, an explanation of all my experiences with the hospital, uh, with the state, uh, besides uh, the people that we requested. This was Dr. Bresnes' office that was asking for this. And they wanted a copy of our hospital, uh, our Poison Center record. And uh, obviously, all of our all of the calls to the poison center are recorded uh, and that's that we go over them to make sure no mistakes were made and they were also for medical liability reasons we want to have a record of what we said uh, and uh, uh, we have no, we had no problem it uh, uh, they would have to send the request and it had to be like a subpoena so we could release a, that uh, medical information but obviously had no problems releasing it and you know they they would not tell us why on october 3rd they're suddenly interested well there we are sitting in our offices wondering what's going on constantly calling and saying hey what's happening at somerset somerset is refusing to answer our telephone calls we're trying to find out whether there are any more events going on. Is there anything we can do to help and, and getting nothing in response? On October, October 27th, uh, detectives from the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office called. Uh, the poison specialists that heard them knew the story. Everybody in our office knew the story and referred the, uh, the call as the detectives to Bruce, who uh, uh, spoke to them. Uh, and the, the detective said to, to Bruce, what can you tell us about Ditch? And, and basically they were, uh, they had no idea that we had been involved. Uh, we still to this day have no idea how they became involved, but somehow they became involved. And since they knew nothing about Ditch, um, they didn't know who to call. So they called the poison center, obviously. So, you know, they talk about serendipity, but they, they called us. And Bruce said, do you mean the cases at Somerset Medical Center? And the detective said, what do you know? And Bruce then said, 
we have a whole dossier on the cases and all the background information. My, and he said, my boss has this big, thick binder with all of the correspondence. And the detectives then said, can we meet? And so Bruce got a hold of me and I said, yeah, I guess. I mean, that's what we have been waiting for all these months. Uh, but we better check with UNDNJ legal because we're not independent of the university. Uh, it was about 1130 in the morning. Uh, and our offices were on the fifth floor of the Bergen building in, at the UMDNJ in Newark. Legal was on the 11th floor. So I left my office and went up to the 11th floor and everybody was at lunch, uh, except for one attorney that was still in our office. And I barged in and I said, I have a problem. I, I need help and told her the story. And she said, of course, you have no choice, but you have to meet with them and you have to make everything available, but get a subpoena does something or other. I don't remember the Latin term for the type of subpoena. Uh, well, we got back to the detectives and said, sure, get us this, the, this subpoena and, and come on down. Uh, and the, as I said, it was uh, about 11.30 and at lunchtime, uh, and we told them we need the subpoena Ducas Tecum. Uh, and within an hour, uh, they were at our door with the subpoena Ducas Tecum. And I am alleged to say, I don't remember it, but I kind of believe it. I said to the, uh, to the detectives, what took you so long? And I was, it was half kidding and half serious because there's no way you can make it from the Somerville where the, their office is into Newark in under an hour. You know, and to have gotten the subpoena written and get to us, they, they must have come with sirens blaring and red light flashing. But I was really talking about why did why was it now October when we first started reporting this in, in July? Uh, and then we had a discussion with them about our involvement. They told us that they had been trying to get records from Somerset Medical Center and had been unable to. Uh, and they wanted copies of, of all of our records. And we gave them my, the, the, it was like a four inch binder that I had with uh, double sided uh, copies of, of all of our communications and everything we've done. And I said, there's a copier over there. Please feel free. Don't take the binder, but feel free to make any copies that, that you wanted. And they then asked me if I would review cases for them uh, if they could get some, uh, some documentations from, from the hospital. And I said, sure. Uh, came up with a, with a case definition. Oh, and I told them, I do not want you to just give me cases that you are suspicious of somebody trying to, to kill, to, to try to poison patients in the hospital, but give me cases that you're reasonably sure that there wasn't a nefarious uh, uh, involvement. Uh, so that that I can be really an independent looker, you know, searcher. I consider myself a scientist. I want to look at it blinded, and I will tell you which I think are, are serious and, and which are not. So I set for myself a, a case definition. If I thought digoxin was involved, I was looking to see if there was a digoxin level. I want to look at an electrocardiogram, if there were any electrocardiograms, because there are certain types of abnormalities that you see on the, the electrocardiogram. And by the way, I, if you notice, I call it ECG, not EKG. A lot of people call it EKG, but we're, that's uh, Dr. Eindhoven, who was the first person to, to establish uh, the, the electrocardiogram spelled it you know, with a K in German in the US. And this is one of my pet peeves, we shouldn't be saying EKG, we should be saying ECG, but anyhow. So I'm looking for that and I'm looking to see if there's dig levels. And remember I told you of this imbalance between sodium and potassium, okay? Now patients that are chronically on dig tend to actually have low potassiums because they uh, literally are leaking some potassium into the serum and then you pee that out. Or they are on diuretics as well, so they tend to have low potassium. So chronic ditch overdoses or chronic ditch toxicity, you tend to have low potassium, but acute ditch toxicity, you tend to have elevated potassium. 
So those, those were, in my case definition, that, that uh, was whether or not DIG was given, was looking for uh, the, that high potassium. Since we were worried about insulin, we're looking at cases with unexplained hypoglycemia. And when DIG goes up, uh, when insulin goes up, and I should have put it on the slide, potassiums tend to go down because insulin dries potassium into the cell. So again, I'm looking for the high, uh, low glucose, low potassium. And then I'm looking for other unexplained uh, deaths with, with peculiar things. And one of them was really very interesting. Uh, my poor wife suffered from it because there was one, one, re one case that they had me review that I was convinced that there was an attempted murder or actual murder. And I just couldn't figure out what was going on. It was a patient that was, uh, had, had people, visitors in the room, uh, and the, the person was, was fine talking, all of a sudden bolted upright in bed, like every muscle in his body contracted, and then collapsed and died, stopped breathing and died. And I couldn't figure out what was going on until one night in the middle of the night, I, I said, I got it, I got it, I got it. Woke up my wife, got scared her out of her mind and went to the computer and wrote up the case. There's a thing called a neuromuscular blocker that's used during surgery. If that, that causes the muscles to contract and then don't relax. And so basically what happens is it paralyzes the muscle. If you gave a bolus, you gave an enormous amount of it at once, you might in fact have every muscle in your body contract. Uh, and that is, uh, that's what I thought happened. And later on, uh, uh, the, the, the perpetrator uh, did admit to using that, that uh, neuromuscular blocker as well. Well, we were doing all of this stuff in the background, trying to keep our own sanity, try to help the, the, uh, the, the, the prosecutors, detectives, uh, to try to get as much evidence to try to figure out which cases were involved so they could try to pin down uh, who the perpetrator might be. And on December 12th, the news hit. Uh, remember the call to the poison center and the report to the health department was in July. So we're talking about, was that five months uh, with us trying to work in the background to try to bring uh, uh, this, this, the story to the front. And it took five months. Uh, this is the uh, Associated Press writer and now we're in December 11th. And this is when they announced uh, it at uh, Somerset Medical Center that uh, a, a male nurse that they said had been fired. And, and honestly, the story was that he had not yet been fired. Uh, and actually, he knew that he was, he felt that he was going to be fired. And he already had lined up another job to go to. Uh, but anyhow, uh, that, that's how the, the news broke. And it said the joint investigation involves a state medical examiner's off poison control center and the Somerville Police Department. Well, obviously not quite correct. Uh, it was, not, we, the, the state medical examiner's office was not involved in it. The poison center was only involved in reporting it and reviewing of, of some of the charts. And it wasn't the Somerville Police Department, it was the Somerset County uh, Prosecutor's Office. But what the heck. Uh, following day, the prosecutor's office uh, said that they were reviewing uh, the work history and uh, the uh, medical center said, well, they were, they were now at this point circling the wagons and trying to blame everything on previous hospitals that a nurse had worked at that failed to, to report. It. Uh, and the Somerset Medical Center said that they were had conducted an inquiry uh, and uh, they're reviewing it independently, et cetera. And this was the first time that the name of the, uh, uh, the nurse was uh, released. Uh, <clears throat> the, the work history uh, then became clear. He had worked at other hospitals uh, and there was serious misconduct, but Somerset Medical Center blamed all the other hospitals for not warning subsequent hospitals and that it wasn't their fault that uh, all of this had happened. It was a fault at, at, at the other uh, hospitals. And they try to claim that it, was, uh, it wasn't until they and uh, Somerset uh, identified him as a suspect that the background be, became clear. Uh, this was a, an email that I got from 
the woman in charge of the licensing investigation uh, on, on December 17th, uh, saying that she's been meaning to reach out to me, but that things had gone a bit bonkers at the health department and uh, kind of thanked me uh, for being the one that uh, uh, continued to, to push them in, in, in the right direction. Uh, the first time in my life I've ever been considered a pearl uh, this uh, Dr. Bresnitz, again, uh, the epidemiologist that said I read too many uh, detective novels, called the office to, and spoke to Bruce. He didn't, he didn't speak to me, but he told Bruce that he was really very upset at the way Somerset had handled the case. Uh, and again, asked for our documentation of everything, including my original phone call uh, to him. This is a New York Times. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with it, but again, uh, this is now on December 21st. Uh, by the way, the, the county prosecutor's office asked us not to make any statements to the press. Uh, and we, uh, we were very fortunate because we were a part of the UMDNJ. So we had literally daily meetings with attorneys for the, the university and public relations people for the university every single morning to plan how we were going to approach um, the, the response to, uh, to this. So what was the ramifications? Well, uh, you, as you can imagine, once, uh, once it broke, uh, the media literally were parked at, at the front door of, of the building asking for interviews. And there's one thing uh, you never want is to have something appear refused to, to uh, comment, uh, but I had no choice. Uh, the, as I said, the prosecutor's office said, do not talk. Um, we had multiple meetings with that. And, and uh, interesting enough, the, the, the Department of Health did not feel that they had uh, had to be abide, abide by the uh, uh, gag order and literally released all the correspondence and many of the uh, recordings of, of the conversations, uh, which uh, without us being able to comment on them, really put us in, in a rather tenuous situation uh, because we had to continue to refuse to comment uh, even when people said, you know, why didn't you report it? And they had no idea that we had reported. Well, in fact, I learned something that once, uh, once you have an interview, it's, it's kind of considered stock footage and can be used. And 60 Minutes used stock footage of me, uh, New Jersey Network used uh, images of me, et cetera. And the prosecutor's office became furious at me. And I said, if you look at it, uh, it was, you know, 15 years ago, I was a lot thinner than had, uh, had, yeah, had blonde hair rather than white hair. And obviously they just reused it. And people from public relations at university uh, called CBS and, and screamed at them. And uh, they refused to, to, uh, uh, to state that it had been stock forward. Um, and, you know, we were questioned why we didn't call the police directly uh, and we couldn't respond to it. We were not allowed to. Uh, January 15th was an interesting day. It was a snow day and my wife and I both worked in Newark and we, we carpooled. The newspaper uh, didn't come to my house. Uh, well, if it had, it was under, you know, a foot of snow. So we didn't get it, but I, it was a machine that sold the star ledger right in front of the building. And I put my 35 cents in and opened it. And there I was on the front page of, of the star ledger. So you can imagine if the media frenzy had not already hit, you can imagine the media frenzy after this thing hit. I mean, uh, I literally had to, to wear costumes. Uh, People would, would they, they would, the media would literally follow my car into parking lots, into my house. It was, it was a real mess. Um, as part of the plea deal, Cullen agreed to uh, provide closure to other families uh, and, and uh, agreed to admit if, if he killed people so that people would, uh, would not have this wonder. So I reviewed many of the cases in question. And as, as I said, I wanted to be blinded. And then I had a face-to-face -face meeting with Cullen in the prosecutor's office. And we spent eight hours going case by case, uh, 
uh, to try to get him to admit to, uh, to killing some of them so that the, uh, the families could have some closure. At the end of it, uh, I was shattered. I, I mean, I've never had experience. I don't know what the temperature really was in the room, but I, I felt like it was below zero. I was so frozen. Uh, and at the end of it, the detective uh, Baldwin and, and Braun looked at me and said, Doc, you look shaken. Is this the first time you ever met a serial killer? Uh, to which point I didn't know whether to laugh or, or what. And I said, well, you know, frankly, have you had much experience with serial killers before? There are also multiple civil lawsuits. I have no idea uh, what the settlement was for. One of the most grueling depositions I ever had in my life uh, was as a fact witness, uh, I was deposed in, in the civil lawsuits. And the, um, the defendants, uh, attorneys from various hospitals, tried their best to destroy me. Uh, and, you know, I'm a scientist. So I answered their questions in, in, in scientific basis and, and they, they couldn't stop, uh, stop what was going on. Well, just before we quit, were there missed opportunities to stop the killings? Well, uh, this was, look at this date, July 1996. This was in a different hospital. This was in Huntington Medical Center. An 80-year-old died. Uh, and of uh, this was a note written by a cardiologist uh, of interest and unexplained is a rising ditch level. Uh, <laughs> It brings up the possibility of ditch toxicity. It doesn't explain why it continued to increase. Duh, it continued to increase because Charles Cullen was a nurse at that hospital and was giving this person uh, a ditch. Uh, after uh, he was convicted and sentenced to, I don't know how many life uh, terms in, in jail, he continued to review cases. And this is his notes. Uh, on a death of another patient. And uh, I, I obviously was a good teacher uh, because he quoted me uh, and, and said that this particular case he was not involved with because it didn't meet my definition of, of the case. <sighs> well, Cullen eventually claimed to kill uh, about 40 patients. Uh, I try to convince him of the, the cop of the guilty to several more. Uh, his comment was he didn't want to look like a monster by uh, claiming to have killed uh, that many more. Uh, he was sentenced to 18 consecutive life sentence, non-parole period of 397 years. So he'll, he'll never see uh, the light of day. Uh, in the spring, summer of 2013, a book came out called The Good Nurse, uh, written by Charles Graber, and exposed, whoops, exposed the work of uh, uh, Amy Ridgway, who was the nurse. I never knew until this book came out how the charts uh, became available, since the prosecutor's office said that the hospital refused to, to give them. They, they found this, this nurse who was, quote, a friend of Charles, and she literally went in after hours and broke all of the HIPAA regulations and literally printed out reams upon reams upon reams of paper that were all over my apartment. My, my poor wife had to live with, with charts spread out all over the place. Uh, and it also describes some of the things that happened inside the uh, Department of Health and why they refused to, to report it. Uh, this is a book review of, of the uh, uh, of, of Graeber's book and talks about the, uh, uh, what, what, what they found uh, and where all the errors have been made and how this could have been prevented. Uh, this is what happened to Dr. Kors. Uh, he went around the country giving lectures on hospital safety uh, and provide the safest. Remember, this is the guy that, that complained to me that I was jumping to conclusions and refused to do anything uh, about preventing any further deaths. And this was the CEO of uh, the, the hospital who then became, quote, recognized uh, specialist in strategic leadership. He was the, uh, the, the CEO of the hospital during the period of time that that we said something was going on. 
the New Jersey legislative passed legislation protecting nursing homes and hospitals from reporting disciplinary actions and actually required them to be reported. It still did not change the regulations of multiple deaths in the hospital uh, as, as a reportable illness. Of recent interest, Netflix uh, had a series on nurses who killed. Uh, episode 10 is Charles. CNN did a show on something's killing me. I, I can't read which episode it was. I told you about the book. In September, whoops, in September, in September, Netflix is due to release two movies. One, a movie version of the book Good Nurse and an accompanying documentary uh, in which Bruce and I and the detectives uh, discuss our role in in that uh, the the good news the the good nurse movie will be a popularized version. I have no idea what what it'll be like. And uh, just a quick that's the book that I wrote that published in two thousand seventeen. Uh, it's fourteen uh, cases of of, uh, of of acute toxicology. Uh, that, that I worked on. Um, my book, Growing Up, The Medical Detectives, was my How to Succeed in Business Without uh, Really Trying, that I think should be on every doctor's shelf or any intelligent person, to be honest. And there's a book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Dangerous Diseases and Epidemics. And that's it. I don't know if there's enough time, but I'm here for answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. That was wonderful. We do have a couple questions, and we'll start off the first with uh, Mike Martin. You have to unmute, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Steve. First of all, thank you for your service regarding this. Uh, you're a real hero in a, in a rather uh, situation. Uh, I think we all appreciate the vigilance you've shown, and persistence, quite frankly. One thing I was a little shocked by was essentially how long it took to investigate this. Now, I'm going to share a little parallel experience that I had. I was in clinical trial management, mm -hmm. and that's, of course, uh, uh, experimenting with unapproved therapeutics for the audience case where you're constantly monitoring uh, toxicology and uh, death among patients. Now, in those cases where something arises unanticipated in the trial, that's immediately reported to an independent clinical advisory board, which in turn is in communication with the FDA. And this is a matter of days or weeks. It's very quick. So the decisions to be made is, are the side effects more serious than anticipated, or if deaths occurs, what's the causality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I contrast that to your experience, and I'm just flabbergasted that this takes that long to investigate something like uh, you, you've, you've done honorable work with. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, they are they're slightly different, uh, and, and in, in clinical trials, you, you're right. Uh, but having done a lot of clinical trials myself, trying to get a hold of the review board is not always so easy. And, and I wish that every single side effect uh, could have could be resolved. You know, could be looked into that quickly. You know, our, our experience, first of all, is that the uh, the investigator has to uh, recognize that there is a uh, some event that has occurred. Uh, and then report it with, without all of that, the, the whole process doesn't get involved. I can tell you that uh, subsequent to this, I was involved with, with at least two other uh, homicides. Uh, and in one, uh, it was not, well, it was an attempted homicide, it wasn't a homicide. And I tried desperately to get the police involved. And by the time they did, it was three or four days into the event. And when the local police finally went to the home where one of the uh, uh, events occurred, you couldn't even tell that the victim had ever even been there. The place had been so well cleaned. So unfortunately, and, and in, those, in that case, I even told them I'm the Marcus from the Cullen case, you know, take me seriously. And they still didn't take me seriously. 
uh, the last case, and it's also one in, in my book, uh, when I spoke to the hospital and I said, I will discuss everything you want, but you have to promise me that as soon as you get off the phone with me, your next telephone call will be the county prosecutor's office. Uh, and they did listen and uh, they did arrest the perpetrator, uh, the, I think the following day or the day after, uh, but the perpetrator was actually allowed to visit the, uh, the patient and probably administered more poison to them right there in the hospital. So they did listen to some extent, but not, not, not fully extent. Um, I, I can't explain it. I, I think uh, most people are, uh, are in kind of incredulous that something like this could be happening. And I think that, uh, that, that uh, inability uh, to think outside of your silo uh, is representative. Can I, can I show another slide? This is uh, what I attribute my, uh, you know, I, I already told you about Ibsen, but Louis Pasteur, you know, said that, you know, in the fields of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. And uh, I don't want to seem conceited, but I spent my whole career preparing for the event that occurred. Uh, the fact that nobody would listen to me uh, was the, the fact that they didn't read Pasteur, <laughs> it, it, you know. Uh, so many things, so many scientific uh, discoveries are, are made by serendipitous uh, findings that unless we teach kids uh, in, in, in our educational system has fallen apart as far as that's concerned. Uh, if, if we don't teach people to be good observers and, uh, and, and watch for these things, they're gonna continue to be missed. Okay, Rich Smith. Yes, uh, Stephen, thank you. Very interesting talk. And again, thank you for your diligence, you know, in investigating this. A couple of real quick questions. I uh, just want to confirm in the timeline, were there any other incidents or deaths caused by Mr. Cullen after you made your initial call to Somerset? And then there was a question in the chat line, in all the discussions with Mr. Cullen, did he ever say a motive on why he did this? You know, serial, so many serial killings? Well, the second one, the second question that I can answer without crying, uh, I, I told the prosecutor's office from the get-go, do not accept him saying he's an angel of mercy. He's just putting people out of their, their misery. The, you know, so you're all mostly elderly patients with, with bad illnesses. There was a 20 some odd year old male that had uh, bone marrow uh, problems. Uh, he could have survived with a bone marrow transplant uh, and he was killed. So this was not a, a mercy killer. And I refused to allow him to even say that, uh, you know, to me. Uh, and we, uh, we were just very matter of fact when I met with him and we went through case by case by case. And I said, you know, I think you gave this person a poison. Uh, and he either agreed or, or didn't agree. I mean, he was no emotion, no, no, no nothing. Uh, yes, there, I, and I don't know the exact number. I, I've heard numbers from, from five to 12 uh, deaths that occurred from my first, after my first call to the health department to the time that the police appeared on, on the door, on our doorstep, the prosecutors, detectives. Uh, so somewhere in, in, in that range of people were killed by Cullen after we, we already uh, had, had reported it. Uh, I am not a psychiatrist, uh, but the, the fact that he showed no remorse, uh, you, you know, you think about the, the possibility of him being a sociopath or just call him an evil person. Uh, going by his track record whenever he went through a stressful period in his time was the time that that more deaths occurred in the hospitals that he was working uh, and, and this this is kind of the way he relaxed some of his his stress thank you i mean it sounds like then the cmo and the president of somerset 
medical should be, you know, you should have been held liable for the additional incidents after your initial call. That's just my opinion. I wouldn't disagree. Uh, and as I said, they both went on to have successful careers in, in <laughs> claiming that they were the heroes. Thank you. Stuart Kurtz, welcome again. Hey, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think my, my first comment um, goes along with a, uh, an expression that we owe so much to so few. Um, I think the fact that um, uh, you and other people have taken uh, up upon yourself uh, the duty uh, to really fulfill uh, the vows you know, in medicine and, and, and so on, it's just wonderful. Um, the second comment is that um, I think one needs to examine what's called organizational behavior. Um, and one of the uh, most prominent aspects of organizational behavior is that you have to protect your organization at all costs. I think the story about the uh, Catholic Church um, and the abuse is exactly that, that situation. But that is actually true across almost all organizations. I've, I've found um, that uh, even at low levels, um, it is persistent and it is enforced internally. Um, uh, and examples are given uh, in so many cases of people being fired you know, for embarrassing the organization. Um, so I, I think one of the, th the learnings that we have to have um, is that organizational behavior is a significant factor um, in correcting injustices and wrongs. Um, I would like your comments. I, well, you, you're right. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how you alter that, you know, that, that behavior, because it's, to some extent, it's, it's a natural behavior. Uh, you know, I called it circling the wagons, but, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> It's it's a fear of of losing uh, support, losing money, what have you, and uh, we we do need to to teach people how to uh, accept responsibility, uh, and that's not easy. But yeah, it's it is it's somehow built into our culture, and and we need to figure out how to make people uh, change that. Uh, you know why. Why was it so easy for me? Because uh, I'm a scientist and I was sure of, of my findings. I was sure that I was right. Uh, and I was not about to back down no matter what was thrown at me. Uh, okay, and we're running a little bit late. So please keep your questions short. Uh, Al Aho, next. Well, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, related to uh, organizational behavior, I've been involved and I've talked to people who've been involved where they have to give press releases in very embarrassing situations. Um, and uh, I heard a story of a university per, uh, person who just became a university president. Uh, members of the football team had dalliances and uh, un fortunate episodes with some townsgirls, and he had to meet with the local press in the town. He was coached on how to conduct his press release. Um, this is related to organizational behavior. You have to protect some people, but you'd also want to say the truth as best as you can. Are medical doctors trained in how to deal with the press? No, <laughs> in a word, no. Uh, I received some training later on uh, in, in the 1990s on uh, risk uh, dissemination and stuff. Uh, the EPA had a, a week-long course that I, that I took that was super. Uh, I was a speech minor in college and, and worked in educational television. And I guess I had the gift of gab. My dad was a salesman, so I guess I had to inherited some of that. So I, I had no fear of, about talking to the press. And I learned very early to have 
clear in my mind what I wanted to say to the press and I was going to stay on target. Thank you. Nolan? Okay, very quickly, I was the guy who put in the chat what could be the motive for all these murders, and I guess you pretty much answered my question. Um, no angel of mercy, which was the only sympathetic explanation, and um, it sounded like you said when something stressful or bad happened in his life, he tended to kill somebody. I was just going to throw out the idea, was it simply crimes of opportunity, that he just killed people in situations when it would have been an easy kill. Is there any relationship between these victims at all? No, and as a matter of fact, one of the really scary things, uh, he would go into the clean utility where they stored IV bags, you know, with fluids, uh, and literally just randomly take out a bag and, and put poison into it. So he wouldn't even know what patient was going to get it. That's how sick the, the, the situation, you know, was. Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a full explanation. Thank you. Ron Hoke. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. This was a very enlightening uh, story about things that are going on that are being covered up and, and, and even when it was a, an obvious situation, a repeated situation, it was still difficult to get the truth out. So what does this infer about attempts or uh, accidents rather where things like this happened not repeatedly by the same person? And how many of those are being missed or uh, uncovered, uh, uh, covered up rather? and that we never know about. Uh, it's, it's a scary thought. Uh, and I have, uh, I have a Google search that, that automatically searches and sends me information about any uh, uh, poison murders. Uh, and every day there's, there's something that I get. Uh, is it still happening? Yes. Are there probably cases like this happening in hospitals uh, around the world? Yes. Uh, there was a recent, two recent cases in Germany, one in Texas, one in uh, Canada. Uh, I have, whenever I read one, I write to the physicians involved and I say, let's have a conference. Let's try to get all of the law enforcement, all the medical professionals together and look at what's in common to see if there's something we can do to prevent situations like this from happening. Nobody is willing to do that. I have no idea why. Uh, but we're, we're not, we, we unfortunately still are a reactive society and we're not being proactive. Uh, so this will continue to happen. Uh, and you just have to depend on some alert clinician picking it up and, and uh, you know, interfering. I'm concerned about uh, not deliberate attempts, but even accidental incidents. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. There, there is a thing called the Joint Commission for Hospital Accreditation that also requires a hospital uh, for any of an event like this to be investigated. I called them uh, in, in my call, various calls to try to get somebody involved. And they told me that it is a mandatory thing, but they have to, they have six months to institute an investigation. And my comment was six months. I mean, how many more deaths do you, that will occur in the six months before they are required to start an investigation? And they just blew me away. That's, that's, uh, Alan Shenowitz, you have the last question. Um, that was a fascinating story and I congratulate you on your achievement in the end. Um, um, it, it just strikes me as extraordinary that um, this chap um, was fired from so many different hospitals and um, uh, it says something about the hiring practices of, um, uh, uh, of Somerset Hospital at least. But um, 
uh, is there any clue from uh, from his history of firings that um, what, what was he fired for in these oh, right. all these other hospitals and so on? Well, as as I said, as I showed you in in the 1990s, there was suspicion that was something going on in Huntington Medical Center. Nobody did anything about it. He left that hospital, went to another hospital. He was he worked at the Burn Center at uh, Saint Barnabas. Mysteriously, all of the records from the time he worked there disappeared. Uh, so we have no idea whether there was anything. My my wife worked in in banking and worked closely associated with human resources. And she will, will tell me that human resources will never send out a report saying that there was suspicions of something bad, okay? Because they were always afraid that the individual would sue them because they couldn't get another job. So what happens is that uh, we learned through Colin, whenever we would hire a nurse, we would call the previous place that they worked for and said, is that person eligible to be rehired? And if they said no, we knew that something bad had, yeah. had gone on. But most, most, uh, and I don't care whether it's a hospital, a bank, or any other firm, is loath to really give a bad evaluation because they're afraid to be sued. And until that uh, changes, there will be the, the, the same potential problem uh, going ahead. But I, I would have thought that um, this string of firings um, was speaking loudly itself, um, but, but even no without the information as to um, what a hospital would say, why they fired him and so on. Well, but they would, the, the, the hospital that he left uh, would not admit that to the next hospital. Uh, and often uh, a hospital, rather than firing somebody, would pressure them and say, if you don't quit, then I'm gonna fire you. And so they would give an individual the opportunity to quit. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a society. Let me just end though by saying that the majority of people that get admitted to hospitals have very good quality care and and the people taking care of them are of, of very high quality and are there to, to help the patient look what happened in, recently in covid my, my friends that that were on the front line i mean one of one of which uh jim pruden in, at saint joseph hospital and you see the story you saw the stories an emergency room doc spent six months on on a ventilator uh, survived uh, he caught it from from patients that he saw these these people uh, maintain their, their practices, uh, put themselves at, at risk every single day. So, uh, you, you know, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to be afraid. Uh, it's always best if you have somebody on the inside looking out for you and streamlining your care. Uh, but, you know, the, the chances of, of another colon getting you is a slim. Thank you. Okay, Steve Heft. Yes, thank you. Uh, Stephen, thanks so much. You really uh, brought to the fore some just fascinating, horrifying, but uh, hopeful information that, uh, that there are people out there who are willing to uh, uh, go to bat for patients, for ethics, for, uh, for right. And uh, we have to believe that that will continue. And thank you very much for your time, for your presentation today. Uh, there are two ways that the old guard uh, provides, uh, shows its appreciation. One is through a certificate. And if you see the certificate, you'll notice that on the bottom left is an orchid. And the orchid is the symbol of the old guard. Uh, because at the time the Old Guard was founded, that the uh, summit, New Jersey, was the orchid capital of the East. So it was used. Yeah, that's kind of right. They read the book on the bottom there. And then the um, world, something in the country. That one got me muted. And secondly, uh, we also give a an Old Guard salute to all our 
guest presenters and Bravo. Thank you. I, I, I just, Steve, I have to tell you something funny about that. Uh, somebody else online graduated from Brooklyn College the same year as I did, the same class as I did, but I worked at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. My job was taking photographs in the orchid. <laughs> and, and Carl Withner was was my mentor through college in, in with, with with orchids. So that really is, you know, talk about small worlds. Yeah. But okay. Thank you very much pleasure. for your time, Steve. Uh,